Hello viewers, welcome back to our YouTube channel. Today we are continuing our discussion and we will be considering the last episode of Act 2, that is episode 7. This is the last episode of uh, this act and this episode begins in page 79 through to page 84. In this episode, we see Nora worried and hopeless, the aftermath of Nora having revealed her secret of borrowing uh, the 250 pounds from Crockstead and that Crockstead has already dropped the letter into the letterbox. Nora is hopeless because it is Toval who keeps the keys to the letterbox and she is aware that around this time is when Torvald normally checks his letterbox. Again, we see Nora becomes witty and uses her tact in delaying Torvald from checking his letterbox, which she hopes he will ultimately find Krogstad's letter. Krogstad's letter, as you know, is detailing the intrigues of a forgery that surrounded the letter. In using her wit, we see Nora tell Torvald that she cannot get on without his help. Relying on Torvald's perception of her as someone who is unreliable. And we correctly remember that every time that Nora has wanted to have her way, we have seen her cash in on Torvald's perception that she is unreliable. Again, we see Nora tell Torvald that he must give himself entirely to her and that he must not do anything on this day or the other day that they are going to dance the tarantella. And that one comes out in uh, page uh, 82. We also see uh, Nora uh, tell Torvald that he must not open a letter, not even the letterbox on this day. So all these statements that Nora makes are aimed at tactfully wooing Torvald from checking the letterbox and its content. Another thing that comes out of this or another subject matter is uh, Nora's deceit. Through dramatic irony, as the reader, so the audience, we are quite aware that the main reason why Nora tells Torvald that she does not know how to dance is not entirely that. But the real reason here is that she does not want Torvald to get to know of her forgery or how she procured the 250 pounds to take him to Italy for treatment. He knows that the letter will explain this to Torvald. When Torvald bows down to Nora's wit, what we see is a chauvinistic character. He's chauvinistic in the sense that he tells uh, Nora that he promises Nora, who he calls his helpless little mortal, that he would be wholly, wholly 
and absolutely at her service that evening. The very names that are characteristic of Tobert. The very common ways with which he refers to Nora comes up again. Again in page 83, we see Toval calls Nora a child by saying that the child will have her way. Still on that same page, when Nora tells Helen, the maid, to prepare lots and lots of macaroons as part of the champagne banquet that they are to have. Toval tells Nora that Nora must continue to be his own little Skylark. Still, the names being used by Toval and Nora are these names that aims at demeaning her, bringing out Toval's chauvinistic character or trait. Going forward, we are also able to see Torvald in this episode coming out as someone who is keen and observant. In page 80, Torvald keenly observes that Nora is worn out. As the readers, we are aware that what has worn out Nora is uh, the issue to do with the anxiety that springs from Krogstad's letter that is already in the letterbox that will expose all her moral corruption to Torvald. Yet, Torvald does not know. But then, what we know is that he is keen and observant when he observes this. Torvald also comments that Nora is sheer mad when she watches her dance more and more wildly, her hair comes down and falls over her shoulders. So Torvald also realizes that this is not a commonplace occurrence. It is not something that just happens. But then he is able to, through this, realize some anxiety that goes on in Nora. Going forward, Torvald also notes that from Nora's anxiety, there must be a letter lying in the letterbox, and that letter must have been from Krogstad. Could be he picks on this from their previous conversation which they had with Nora and from the way that Nora pleaded with him not to really send the dismissal letter to uh, Krogstad. Again in this episode we see Nora's defiance, Nora's defiant nature that has been rising over time. And in this episode, in page 83, we see Nora tell Helen the maid that alongside the champagne banquet that they are to have, that, Nora, that Helen should include macaroons. And we know that in the Helma house, Helma had forbidden macaroon from being eaten, specifically by Nora in this house. That defiant nature of Nora is what broods and ultimately at the end leads to her penultimate rebellion. And that is what leads her to leave her matrimonial home. 
In page 84, we are again treated to a verbal irony, something that we had talked about in episode 6. When we were on episode 6, we saw Nora tell Mrs. Kristen Lind that a wonderful thing is going to happen. Nora repeats this in page 84 when she says, It is splendid to be waiting for a wonderful thing to happen. She answers to Mrs. Kristen Lind, who has come from uh, Crockstad's place and has not found him and has decided to leave a note for him. Nora does not see why Kristen Lind ought to be bothered, but she says that it is splendid that a wonderful thing should be let to happen and that Mrs. Kristen Lind should not have to bother about telling Proxter to recall back the letter. As we will come to realize in the last act of this text, that the wonderful thing, at least from Nora's perspective, does not come to happen. Because Nora expected that in the end, when the secret of her forgery comes out, as has been promised by Tobal, that Tobal will take everything upon himself and he will plead guilty. This statement is ironical because in the end, the wonderful thing does not come to happen. Nora tells Helma that nothing horrid must come between them before the Tarantella dance. There is an element of foreshadow. Nora looks forward to the time that Toval is going to be aware of the forgery that she committed. And she knows that her home is not going to be the same as it was before. So she foreshadows a situation whereby the atmosphere at home is not going to be agreeable. And that is what later on happens when Nora decides to divorce Toval at the end and leave her matrimonial home. That also comes out in Nora's soliloquy in page 84. As we know, soliloquy is whereby a character speaks to themselves. So the soliloquy in page 84, we can have a look at it, where Nora states, then she looks at her watch, five o'clock, seven hours till midnight, and then four and 24 hours until the next midnight. Then the tarantella will be over, 24 and seven. 31 hours to leave. So Nora uh, foresees a situation where she only have 31 hours to leave. Maybe at the Helmer's house or maybe she wants to get done with it. She wants to commit suicide such that she does she, uh, because she genuinely loves Tobald she does not want Tobald to carry Across. It will be interesting to see how this shapes up when we come to the final act of this text, that is Act 3. The next time we meet, we will be looking at Act 3, Episode 1, uh, episode one Analysis. Thank you viewers. If you've not subscribed to this channel, remember to like, subscribe, and share.